I'm Travis Bader, and this is the Silver Core Podcast. Join me as I discuss matters related to hunting, fishing, and outdoor pursuits with the people and businesses that comprise the community. If you're new to Silver Core, be sure to check out our website, www.silvercore.ca, where you can learn more about courses, services, and products that we offer, as well as how you can join the Silver Core Club, which includes 10 million in North America wide liability insurance to ensure you are properly covered during your outdoor adventures. Before we get rolling with this episode, I'd like to do a little bit of house cleaning. And to that end, I would like to remind everybody that if they're enjoying the Silver Core podcast, if they like what they hear, let us know. Leave a comment, click like, subscribe, tell your friends. You can find the Silver Core podcast on all major podcast providers out there. We're also on YouTube and you can find us through social media and speaking about different social media platforms we're also on clubhouse now so if silver core club members are interested in partaking in a live podcast on clubhouse we'd ask for two things number one let us know number two let us know how to use clubhouse so we can do this (laughs) now without further ado Today I'm joined by the Director of Directions for International Barrels, the makers of high quality, premium grade rifle barrels, Ryan Stacey. Hey, how's it going? Ryan, welcome back to the Silver hey, Core thanks. Podcast. Thanks. As well, we've got the publisher and owner of Caliber Magazine. Caliber Magazine's going into its 10th year, producing Canadian firearms content, top drawer premium quality magazine. If you're a member of some organizations, I believe the CSSA is one of them. You will already be getting the caliber magazine. Thank you for joining us today. Daniel Fritter. Hey Travis, long time to talk. Yeah, it has been a while, hasn't it? Yeah. I mean, it's been like years, man, when I was going down there and dropping off magazines back in the day. I remember that. In fact, right. We're talking off air here, but Our first meeting happened right here in the podcast studio. That was my office before that, before we turned into the podcast studio. Yeah. And for those that that are listening and maybe not know, uh, Silver Core, obviously based out of Delta and Caliber started up based out of Delta as well. And, uh, uh, our office was, I think about 10 minutes away from your guys' office and about 12 minutes away from the brewery that's down the street from your guys' office. Yes. (laughs) Good times. Brewery. (laughs) I need one of those near IBI. Yes, you hey, do. Hey, talk to those Four Winds guys around the corner from Travis's place. They make some good beer. <laughs> mm, interesting. Well, I'm really glad to be able to be chatting with you again here, Daniel. It's Bill C21, particularly, that kind of got us talking offline here. And then we thought, you know, you've got some pretty good insight. You're a sharp cookie. You're a smart guy. You got some good insight that I figured that the Silver Core podcast listeners would like to hear. And Ryan and I are both affiants on the order and council firearms prohibition and have a little bit of insight from, from that perspective, providing the court's information so they can make the best available decision with all the information available. And I guess, you know, Dan, you were, you spoke at the Senate about bill C-71. So I'm going to have to throw in a big old disclaimer at the front of this. None of us are lawyers, but we're going to spend some time just sort of openly discussing different ideas from a different viewpoints in regards to some of the recent legislation, policy regulations that have been coming down the pipe. And, uh, and we'll just see it from a few different perspectives and see if we can kind of get ourselves caught up on, uh, up to where C21 is. Sounds good. Well, I mean, to take it back to C71, I think, um, you know, the, the problems there, uh, I mean, as you said, we're, none of us are lawyers, but. Ian Runkle is one, Mm -hmm. and I think we've all seen a lot of his content, and uh, I think we can all probably say with some degree of confidence that the people responsible for drafting this bill maybe weren't the best of lawyers, if they were lawyers at all, Mm. Um, or conversely, you know, because I'm I'm aware that there will be some lawyer out there that works for the Crown that may watch this and goes, wow, that Dan guy's a dick, I worked really hard, but that that other guy, he (laughs) he wouldn't give me any leeway. Mm -hmm. Um, Because I think that's probably closer to the truth is uh, with C21, I mean, I've done a video already, but for those that don't know, my personal attitude is that um, it comes down to a scheduling conflict. 
because this bill was introduced. I haven't checked the calendar as of right now, but we're still in the latter half of the month, so it should be sitting months. So for those that don't know, the parliamentary calendar for the House of Commons, generally they seat or they sit half the month. Uh, it's typically been the last half of the month. Um, and before everyone says, like, oh, lazy parliamentarians, they're actually very hardworking people. Even some of the Liberal MPs are incredibly hardworking individuals that serve their constituents very well. And to do so, that requires spending time in their constituency. So they spend half their time back home and half the time in Ottawa. So it, it makes total sense. Um, but that means that they only get half the time to actually do government business in Ottawa. They can't vote or debate or have parliamentary procedure progress without the parliament actually sitting. And obviously, even with these weird hybrid sessions that they're having, the calendar is the calendar. They can't take days out of that calendar. It's actually part of the way the parliament is managed. When Justin Trudeau announced C21, there was only 55 days left in the parliamentary calendar. Um, there's less than, we're into the 40s now, I think. Um, mm. So it's dwindling. They said that second reading is going to happen sometime later this week, which I will confess, you know, obviously as a gun owner, I don't think there's any gun owner out there that wouldn't be able to get out of a psychologist chair without at least some degree of generalized anxiety diagnosis. <laughs> um, but I mean, I hear these headlines and you get the little heart flutter of, oh shit, maybe it's real, but... Um, oh, can we swear on this, by the way? Is that allowed? Swear away. Sure. Okay. Whew. It might happen accidentally, but it'll keep it to a minimum. <laughs> um, yeah, it may not happen, uh, or it might happen, but then I think the reality is that 55 days, for, for those that don't know, so you got you have first reading in the House of Commons, second reading in the House of Commons. Typically, not much happens between those two, especially with government bills, because go so private members' bills and government bills, government bills are backed by the government, private members' bills are smaller bills that a private member puts out that the government may or may not have consulted on dramatically. Typically, private members' bills don't make it. Government bills are the big ones that are policy. Mm -hmm. So this is a government bill. They've got lots of background on it. So private members' bills between first and second reading, they do see some degree of editing because someone may read it and go, someone across the aisle go, you're an idiot. This is unconstitutional, illegal, whatever. And they'll make a change and they'll give it a second reading in the house just to say, I'm serious about this. I've made the edits, right? And then it'll be read the second time. So obtaining a second reading is, is very easy on the calendar. It gets really tricky to get the third reading because in between second and third reading, you have the committee stage where the parliamentary committee on, um, I believe the parliamentary committee is the national, national security and public safety. Um, I think parallels the Senate committee. Uh, and that committee is comprised of MPs. The makeup of it reflects that of the House of Commons. So it is a minority committee with liberals chairing it. Um, but this is where it'll get messy is because, you know, even if they can get the second reading, which they obviously will this week, it's just a scheduling thing. They don't have to discuss anything. But once they put it into the committee, uh, the committee schedule actually, for example, we, the we scandal is a great example of this. Remember how like we sure. were seeing all those headlines progress and progress and progress. And then it hit committee. And it stopped. Mm -hmm. Like it just, you heard nothing else about we, same as SNC. It was committee, 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 and then it just stopped. Because yeah. although the liberals do control the committee and they can bring things to a stop, they don't have the majority to to progress things beyond that. So things just get parked in committee. So like the we scandal is still being heard in the committee because the liberals can't move on, but they have enough people to stop progress. Mm -hmm. And we're going to see the same thing here because, I mean, this is the bill that determines this is a multi-billion dollar buyback. The government has to know this at some level. And none of the scheduling makes sense. Like it's a, so, you know, to go back to the main point, you've got 40 days to get this through a committee where the Bloc Quebecois will try and be painting the Liberals into a corner to say, if the gun buyback isn't mandatory, it's not a buyback. So the Liberals will have to be doing some kind of politicking with the Bloc. The NDP doesn't know how they're going to stand because they're probably pulling on it still to figure out, you know, where do we, is it mm -hmm. meant? Because in the political scheme, Basically, you got the three levels of rollback, which is what the CPC wants to do is roll it back, stop the buyback. Then you got the liberals that are, it's a buyback, but you, you can keep your stuff. Um, and obviously for gun owners, we look at that and go, well, maybe we get to keep it down the road. Who knows? <laughs> um, and then the other one is the mandatory buyback. And then the, the last one beyond that is mandatory seizure right. of no compensation seizure. Now that is an ethic. That's a thing. Gun owners need to realize there are people out there that want that. Mm -hmm. So like, don't forget that's on the table because people do start to they shift the goalpost and they forget like, no, the goal was always this wide guys. Like, right. We got to worry about those things. Um, and because there's the rumored election coming up in June or the fall and minority governments only last 450 days on average. This one's already passed the average minority government expiry date in Canada. No minority government. I think actually one minority government has gone the full four term, hmm. but it was once and it was like in the forties or something. Hmm extremely extenuating circumstances. So long story short, I just don't see this bill beating 
Justin Trudeau's next election writ because he has his when you think of Justin Trudeau's priorities, winning the last election is like here. And, he, and you got your hand up high. Guns, yeah. way higher. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, and then his actual gun stuff is way lower. So this is just to get votes. So what I think he's going to do. Um, this is just my, this is conjecture mm -hmm. so, you know, from someone that's watched politics on guns for 10 years. What I think is going to happen is they're going to run this thing through as close as they can get. They're going to put as much effort into getting it as close to the finish line. And then they're going to drop the writ and they're going to try and drop the writ on some sort of leveraged legislation or policy to try and make it look like the liberals are not the ones asking for this election. Then they're going to campaign on the notion that the conservatives demanded this election, the conservatives killed off the gun ban bill, the conservatives canceled the buyback, and you got to vote liberal to keep the buyback on rails, mm. is what I think they'll do. Because mm. I think this, because also too, when you look past this and you go, where do they go beyond this? What's the next election promise? If they pass this law, what do they promise the anti-gun people next? Because they're not going to just let those people swim away from the voting block. Mm. Like they're, they're in the sales funnel for the liberal party. They're not just going to be like, okay, well, we're done with you. You can go vote for whoever you want now. Yeah, they have to they're going to keep those people more. on the line. Yeah. So, and there's nothing past this. They can't ban handguns. The bill's too big. There's 2 million of them. It's too much. It's just not worth it. Like, I don't think any government wants to go down that road of buying 2 million handguns. Like the bill would be huge. Like just fundamentally. It's, it's something on the balance sheet no one wants politically. Well, and the, and the balance of probabilities here and on that spectrum that you've already pointed out, buyback might not be necessary. I mean, it depends on when you say, cause you always have to look at these, whenever I look at stuff now with the gun laws, it's a question of, do you look at it from the perspective of what will this do from a legislative slash punitive slash enforcement perspective versus what will this do with the ballot box? Mm -hmm. Because so much of the legislation and policy that's come out of this government, and I'm not just saying this, this isn't. I'll be totally blunt. I'm not an overly partisan person. I'm not a big fan of the liberals because I work in the gun industry, obviously, and I don't like the way they govern our country in general. But um, so don't. But I don't want people to think this is a partisan snipe. But generally speaking, this government has not been terribly effective at governing for the last five years. They have not passed many actual laws. They have not actual. Like I mean. They haven't changed much. Gun owners are a prime example of like, I know our lives will change dramatically and it's a huge, huge concern. And we are at, we are at the brink of losing all of our guns, but I'll be blunt. It took six years to get here. Like six years, this government has been promising to do this for six years. It took them six years to do this, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. uh, they're, they don't do much very quickly, do they? Like, <laughs> no. um, so it's one of those kind of. Uh, this idea that the government is suddenly going to go from a government that has passed, you know, some of the smallest volumes of legislation in history to passing the largest and most sweeping and most expensive piece of gun control legislation in Canada's history in less than 40 days during a global pandemic strikes me as far-fetched. Mm -hmm. Is there any way that they can push it through uh, with a different method other than, uh, I mean, obviously yeah, they can't yeah, do the um, again, but could. is there another way they can do it? He can't OIC this because um, technically speaking on the uh, legally, uh, they can OIC things that are on regulation. So yeah. they can OIC the AR-15 because it's it's a regu like the, the document is called regulations. Uh, it's mm -hmm. not legislation. It's not an act. They can OIC acts as well. But the thing with OICs is you can't OIC anything that involves procurement. If there is a dollar bill attached dollar to values. anything, yeah. it has to go through the House of Commons because OICs are intended to change typos. That's why I see legal intention for the parliamentary mm -hmm. procedure was literally because all of Canada's laws are passed in English and French. And sometimes when they do the French translations, the words don't quite match up and you can end up with laws that say like, you can't ride your horse down the street, meaning you can't ride your turtle down the street or something stupid like that. <laughs> Obviously I don't speak French because someone in Quebec is like, those words mean nothing alike. <laughs> True. Um, BC guy. Um, yeah. Yeah. But like, that's what OICs are supposed to be for because they didn't want to have the House of Commons sitting and having 338 paid MPs go like, yeah, we want to correct the typo on page 284 of the criminal code. So they said the Privy Council was supposed to have the right to just change small incons er, inconsequential things in general. And then that expanded out into this regulatory framework, but it hasn't expanded into procurement. And thankfully, the one thing people also should think about, um, the only reason that Justin Trudeau can't do this is because... The Conservative Party and even the NDP even, but mostly the Conservative Party, made a massive issue out of the Liberal Party trying to pass that bill early on in the pandemic that would have given the Liberal Party both taxation and spending powers. 
Mm. Because what it would take for Justin Trudeau to pass this unilaterally would be essentially the modern version of the War Measures Act, which is what they were looking at passing early in the pandemic. And the government basically said, we're going to pass this, but we're not going to give you the spending ability and the taxing ability to just tax and spend however the government wants, because that's that's pretty crazy. Um, but if he had gotten that, then yes, this bill could have just been a ramp essentially an executive order of oh, I'm going to mm. spend five billion. And the only reason, so people, if you're watching this, are going, well, how can you spend so much money so quickly on pandemic response? We fast track stuff in the house. Um, pandemic response bills were given fast track ability, so it's a whole. Those bills do go through that kind of more war measures type framework. It still does replicate the parliamentary framework, but it's been streamlined um, for emergency purposes. But anything that isn't pertaining to COVID response has to go through the normal framework and isn't given the benefits of all those pandemic stuff. So if anyone's listening and wondering why there's a disconnect there and why I'm saying they can't pass this, but they can pass CERB response in two days. Mm -hmm. It's one is an emergent thing. One is a long-term policy, you know, Shockingly, Westminster parliaments don't give government the ability to pass anything they want just because there was an emergency. <laughs> Shockingly. Good. So Close, the, though. <laughs> a little bit too close, I think we can all say. <laughs> you know, I'd agree with that. Now, the Silver Core podcast is shooting, hunting, outdoor adventures. There's going to be people who listen to this who don't have a firearms background, aren't interested in firearms, but should probably still be concerned about some of the things that are being proposed in C21. Can you speak to that? Oh, can I? Um, <laughs> there's where to start. Well, I mean, first off, for anyone that's listening to this and who is thinking, and I mean, uh, it's it's doubtful um, because I mean, they're they're seeking out gun podcasts, mm -hmm. probably are kinds of folk. But if they're talking to someone, if they find someone in their life that goes, you know what, Dan, it doesn't matter to me. Like I don't own an AR-15, and I've had people like I have people. I own a gun magazine. I have people in my family that think that don't mm -hmm. know the point, all that kind of thing. Those people, you should just tell them that if C-21 passes, it will mean the end of guns in Canada, period. Mm. Because functionally what it will do um, is, is the framework that it provides for is um, almost completely replicating much of the framework that was put in place by a former liberal government to remove alcohol and tobacco from the mainstream consciousness. Now, I'm not saying guns are the same as those two things, because as someone that drinks very sporadically and minimally because of health reasons that are personal to me, mm. um, I don't think either of those things are terribly healthy. I do think guns are actually a perfectly healthy product. So before anyone mis misunderstands that. I would that. disagree on rum. <laughs> <laughs> I would, I don't honestly disagree. I could totally make the argument that a nice scotch late at night is a very, very healthy thing for me on certain times, but Ooh, I have a I gut agree. issue that means I pay for it the next day. So unfortunately <laughs> it's a like, ah, uh, pick and choose. Um, but I worked in the car industry back when they were kicking tobacco out of everything uh, and alcohol. And people will remember that we used to have a thing in Canada called the Molson Indy. And mm -hmm. the clue to why it went away might be in the name. Um, and they're doing the mm. same thing. Obviously, C21 has an advertising ban. It yep. won't actually impact our business. So if people think this is me being self-interested, it won't. no one advertises guns from a self-defensive perspective in our magazine, really. And those that do will have no problem with switching it. It's usually U.S. advertisers that are just trying to save money on graphic design that have but a it, budget, to be blunt. It, it doesn't say self-defense. It says violence. Violence in general. Violence uh, in most general. Of just listing. So most Does that count violence just, against animals? Right. I don't like, think what so. Are we talking I actually read it here. When you actually read the law, I think it says violence perpetrated against persons okay. is actually in the, because I know the parliamentary summary says that, but I think mm -hmm. the actual legislation says against persons. Because I remember thinking like, what about bear defense? Because yeah. Marlins mm -hmm. always run some big bear defense ads. Um, Just hunting in general, really. Right. Kind of violent. Um, the my bigger concern, however, is that uh, in a really fundamental way, like let's let's say C21, the Liberals win. This is what's going to happen if the Liberals win. C21 will likely be expanded to include additional things because they won't just roll the same thing out post-campaign. They'll need to give yeah. some fresh meat to the base to try and get them on next time. So there'll be something else, something mm -hmm. stupid and bad. Um, probably some kind of handgun limitation, something around there. They won't buy them back, but they'll try and get... Handguns are still the thing that are not on the table for the Liberals. So they'll find some way of putting them on the table. And, but moot point anyways, um, at the end of the day, the municipal handgun ban, right? What's the one thing that every gun club has a problem with in Canada right now? It is real estate development encroachment and the encroachment taking the form of noise complaints. Mm -hmm. We see it nationally, Port Coquitlam, like there's not a major sure. urban center where a major urban centers are the fastest growing areas in Canada. So the cities are expanding faster than the rural areas. 
they're encroaching onto where the gun clubs used to be out in the boondocks. And now the developers, who just by virtue of having a lot of money and being in a world where they have to interface with municipal politicians on a daily basis to get zoning permits, those municipal develop or those real estate developers are closer to municipal staff and council than gun club executive is. And when you read these things and you go, okay, well, if the municipal municipalities can shut stuff down, right? What, how long is it? I mean, before every city council in Canada decides that it's just easier to allow the gun club to go bankrupt by shutting down handguns, because most clubs make their money off of restricted ownership, mm-hmm. right? Like if you have a restricted gun license, you don't technically have to have a gun club membership, but most people, it's the easiest way. So most people just maintain a gun club membership because they have mm-hmm. a restricted license. If they get rid of municipal handgun ownership, the local clubs that retain membership because that's what the local restricted owners belong to, to maintain their handgun possession. They may only shoot three times a year. I was that guy when I first got into Mm -hmm. shooting. I got a handgun. I belonged to the Abbotsford Fishing Game Club. I shot like three times a year, but I still was a member. I paid my 200 bucks because I owned a handgun and I had to have it. I had to have a license and or a club on my license, right? If they pass a municipal ban and the Abbotsford Fishing Game Club can't operate because Abbotsford Fishing Game, Abbotsford City Council says no more handguns, the Abbotsford Fishing Game Club will lose its membership Mm-hmm. within years like the restricted guys that currently make up the cohort of apps for tactical shooters and all the handgun stuff all the ipsic stuff all those core cohort of guys that you always see at the gun club when you go shooting the guys with the they used to shoot the ar-15s there yep. they shoot the handguns there now they won't be there and that means the gun club won't be there mm-hmm. and when you look at the larger i mean real estate is still the fastest growing and the only economic sector that is growing at a time when canada's economy is basically looking like it's going to crater. Hmm. So in what world do you see city councils putting gun clubs over real estate developers with millions of dollars of yep. development and potential? Mm-hmm. Like you've got a club of maybe three to 400, maybe five, 6,000 people, 12,000 people. If you're Burlington and Ontario and you're in the densest area, hmm. what do 12,000 people paying a few hundred bucks in a sport that if you're a politician looks like it's on the dying edge of things, versus a real estate developer saying I can put in on an 80 acre plot how many towers can they install how many how many apartment buildings at $600,000 per unit can they build Mm -hmm. gun clubs do not have a chance against that kind of might and I'm one of those people that if you put a bad thing out there and you make it possible for it to happen eventually it will happen every day the universe hits reset groundhog day runs over again and that might happen again today (laughs) and eventually it will so if they pass this law, that saying of every hammer, when you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Every gun club will eventually look like a nail. And it, it, I don't care if you're the Burlington Gun Club, Peel, if you're right in the middle of a downtown urban southern Ontario area, or if you're in Fort St. John, at some point, that city that you live in, that you drive out of to get to your gun club, if they pass this ban to get rid of your gun club, you'll never get it back. And once the gun clubs are gone... I mean, that doesn't even get into the issue around gun shops. I mean, gun shops in Canada, we don't get the benefit of the big box stores that have the support of selling fishing gear. Like Cabela's can sell less guns because they sell fishing gear and boats and all this other stuff. So if they ban one gun, Cabela's just sells more Gore-Tex jackets to offset it. But our local gun shops, the guys that we all love and rely on, you know, those independent shops, if they ban handguns in the city of Vancouver, we all know of various gun shops that would probably really have a hard time making that work. You know, Mm -hmm. um, they would probably be able to keep the lights on. We see that in Australia. A lot of shops did manage to stay open, but there was a massive reduction in overall volume. Um, And I think that's where, like, this isn't, we're not looking at the guy that has the 3030 Winchester that goes, this doesn't matter to me. Like, you're not going to have anywhere to sight your rifle in. You're not going to have anywhere to shoot sporting clays. You're not going to have a retailer to bring in the latest version of that ammo that you wanted. Like, we will become a third rate nation of gun owners that just get stuff because, you know, for a little while there, it was nice. We were climbing. The market was climbing. We were getting more stuff out of the U S and we all saw, we go to shot show readers may not know this and listeners rather, mm. but like we all go to shot show every year and we talk to U S distributors and it was finally reaching a point under primarily Trump because the U S sales were kind of leveling off that earlier that Canada was getting some respect from the U S market. And we were starting to see some product come out in more timely fashions. And we were seeing little things like, product managers would, would would start to send emails to Canadians and say, oh, look at this new thing that's coming out of America. And, mm-hmm. um, 
now with this new law, we're just going to become another also ran because that's what they thought of us as. Is, oh, we're the weird country that you can't own an AR-15. And then once we started to adopt these modern firearms and adopt modern shooting and go like, oh yeah, three gun is a perfectly viable sport. People start loving it and doing it a bunch. Ryan Stacy, I mean, I remember Ryan. I mean, I've known Ryan for years, like predating even Caliber. Mm -hmm. And when he was shooting for the BCRs, like I remember thinking like, who does this weird obscure sport? This is going back probably 14, 15 years now. Yep. And I was like, who does this? Now, <laughs> it's super main. It's not mainstream per se, but it's way more mainstream than it was. Yeah. Like, I'm sure when Ryan tells, I'd be curious, Ryan, like when you talk to people, your backgrounds and you're shooting busily and stuff, you know, when you first got into it and you first started being successful, it was like 10, 12, 14 years ago at the BCRs, like, yep. has, have, have you noticed like a shifting attitude amongst the general population when you talk about what you do? I think so. Yeah. I mean, it's uh, a lot more acceptable. Um, by the time I Because I feel was, like the John Wick, the, the Jerry Michalik videos, the... Oh, yeah, totally. I all mean, the uh, Terran videos that are out there. Everyone yep, media that watched... Media has a huge... Um, uh, what's called Keanu Reeves? Reeves? Yeah. The Keanu sure. Reeves shredding video? Like... Yep. I mean, that's not even really what I do, but... Uh, no, but I think that's what... Like, you say competitive that's what shooting, it, and people just yeah. go, oh, I, they have a comprehension, yeah, they, right? they understand it now more than they did before. Because I think before, if you told people I do competitive shooting, I don't think they even had a frame of reference of what that would look like. Like, well, obviously, what you do doesn't look like what... Terran does, no, but sure. I don't think people had any idea what it was. I they, think if you said that you were, you're a competitive shooter and you used an AR-15, people would look at you like, what? Isn't that just for... And I think that relates to, people. like, I mean, with the OIC, which you guys are both applicants on, and, and the, the, um, the recent decision there for the injunction, and I, that was relating to culture, right? Mm -hmm. And I remember when that came down and I heard about it, and I thought about the culture argument and I thought, you know, like, it's really interesting. Like, it's really interesting to me that the, the, the courts are saying that they're not seeing a culture here they're that's being... not looking hard enough. Reduced. I mean... It's there. It's I mean, it's, it's... I all say for me, like, it's a bit tragic because it feels like a bit of a two-time thing. Because like I said, like, I'm a, I'm a car guy. I, I like guns, but I'm a car guy first and foremost. I don't hate that. Um, always have been, always will be. And for me... It's really sad to, I came out of the automotive sector after the end of the Molson India. I used to, I used to work the Molson India. I was press. I went yeah. down there. It was like the greatest weekend of my life. Like we spend all weekend in a race paddock. It's great. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember the same arguments because the city council of Vancouver, ironically municipal politics again, yep. and the advertising ban around alcohol and all those things are, oh, we don't want these sponsorships of tobacco and alcohol in the public eye was leading to the exact same discussions of, well, motorsports isn't really a sport. We really shouldn't be promoting this. this is bad for the environment. It's so noisy. Literally the exact same arguments that I'm now hearing around guns. And it's so tragic to me that the people in the gun community aren't seeing it because the thing that's happened to cars, car guys will understand this. Like in the lower mainland, for example, there was a Westwood racing circuit. It was big enough that Al Unser senior raced there. It was a <laughs> global racing circuit. It's currently a real estate development on the top of Port Coquitlam, a little bit down from the Port Coquitlam Fishing Game Club. If you actually look on Google Maps at Westwood Plateau Real Estate Development, if you look at the perimeter, it looks like a racetrack because it is the old racetrack. Mm, um, interesting. The exact same things are happening. And Port Coquitlam Fishing Game Club is on the same freaking road as Westwood was. And they're looking at closing because of real estate development encroachment. Because again, they're, it's a cultural thing. Because I hate to say it, gun owners are not doing themselves any favors with this rapidly angry rhetoric. We have to reach out. We have to recognize we are the minority. We don't have the power to change the massive amounts of people's opinions by simply saying you know we own guns and like it's okay we're not a problem it's not enough to say that because i've seen it a lot of something i've brought up like i've thought about a lot recently because of the c21 debate and i see people bring up a lot that they're targeting they're targeting legal gun owners has been a very common refrain in the media that i've seen um or gun owners saying you know they're victimizing legal gun owners when they take our guns away and i think I get it. I, I do. It's possible. Like, as a gun owner, yeah, they absolutely are. That is an absolute truth. But there's a point, too, where you have to recognize it within the, within the context of the discussion around, around guns, when you think that the discussion around gun policy is actually a discussion of public safety policy. Mm -hmm. When you've got a cohort of people that are involved in the discussion, whether we like it or not, saying, we're the victims, we're being targeted, and... And the people are, and, and then you've got a third, you the third party, you've got the anti-gun and the pro-gun people saying, you know, we're being targeted, we're law-abiding gun owners, it's not our fault. And then you've got the pro, the anti-gun people saying, nope, guns are the problem, get rid of all guns. 
the massive amount of people involved in this debate are on the sidelines just watching, right? And what they're watching is a bunch of anti-gun people make, frankly, very emotional, rabid and logically yeah. inconsistent arguments that don't stand up on their own. And gun owners making, to be totally frank, equally emotional Mm -hmm. Sometimes equally illogical arguments in response, instead of being the rational voice and going, hmm, when it comes to a discussion of young kids killing themselves and each other in the streets with illegal firearms over drugs because they have no better possible outcomes in their life than a potential being killed in an alleyway making tiny sums of cash selling dime bags because i hate to say it but street level dealers do not make a killing these are these are truly marginalized people living unfortunate existences that none of us would wish upon our best our worst enemies never mm. mind anyone in our family um, those are the people that are also involved in this discussion and gun owners are so constantly trying to say it's not our fault it's not our fault or not our fault because we we are kind of been targeted in the past that it's almost like we've lost sight of our role in this discussion is to be the the arbiters to say look as the legal gun owners as the experts on the laws around gun ownership i'm not here to tell you that i'm a victim or a target we don't have a right it is a it is it, it's just not a right it's not a government right bestowed upon us to own firearms we have to make our case with diplomacy and i don't see that anymore and it's it's it doesn't work we're we're it's 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 problematic to me i guess because i just don't it's it's really hard because i i have to confront the journalists right because mm -hmm. what I'm saying is when I see the, and this is getting awkward now, but I will just you can leave all this in if you want. But um, <laughs> fundamentally, I, I think it has to be said. I don't mind that people might not like hearing this, but let's just put it in the context of I do a media interview, did one last week. And a guy goes, okay, well, this guy online, you know, the guillotine comment, right? Yeah, it's pretty extreme. I don't, I don't think that we should be talking about bringing the guillotine out quite yet. Mm. Um, the liberals is that a thing? Actual, I must have missed that. Yeah, there was a thing where some people make public comments because, of course, on the media, they do have access to social media. So, of course, they're trolling the same. I don't mean trolling as in like they're typing out and trolling. I mean, they're trolling yeah. as in you're fishing. They're looking. Um, they're looking for comments, right? And I same thing. I, you want to talk about how high this goes? Not to sound like that sounds super conspiracy. Here it comes. Take off my Alex Jones tinfoil hat. Yep. <laughs> when I was giving my testimony on C-71 at the Senate, Senator Mary Lou. Um, I won't say her last name because I can't even remember it, but I remember her first name because that's the only Mary Lou I've ever met in my life. Um, <laughs> she literally made a point of every single pro-gun witness. She had gone extensively through their social media backgrounds, including as far as when the president of a local gun club was called to testify. She had gone through the gun club's Facebook page, and she tried to make him answer for comments left by gun club members and by the gun club executive posting comments that he didn't leave on the Facebook page himself. Hmm. So that's the level to which those of us that I think the government refer to as stakeholders, i.e. people that have skin in the game when it comes to all these things or have at least a large background of research, um, those individuals like we're being forced to answer for what everyone is putting out there. And I'm frankly getting really tired of people putting it out there that Justin Trudeau is going to kick my door down and put me in the back of an MLVW and what drive me to the Vernon cadet summer training camp for imprisonment. <laughs> like there's, like, yeah. it's getting a bit, you know, this is a law. We are a nation of laws. When I see people on my own Facebook page on caliber saying, when I say he can't, he's not, it's unlikely that he can pass this in 55 days. And I go, well, he's, then people go, oh, he'll, 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 oh I see it. And I go, well, he can't. That's legally impossible. It's unconstitutional. Well, he'll do it anyways. No, he won't. Like that's, that's very much not something he can possibly do. And I think that we as gun owners need to strive to elevate our discourse. And when I say that, I mean, everyone's fucking discourse <laughs> needs mm. to go up a notch or two. Yeah. And they need to start thinking, like, instead of punching down, when you see comments from anti-gun people that make you angry, if you feel angry, do what you would tell your five-year-old to do. Walk away. Come back with mm. a clear head. Come back with good arguments. Come back with arguments that make the people watching on the sidelines think you're the professional. I mean, it's basic stuff, like even little things on interviews where you watch, and I won't name names because they're out there, but mm -hmm. you watch interviews with some people that work at this industry. The anti-gun person shows up to do the interview, they're wearing a doctor's lab coat because it brings with it an air of authority. You see someone in a lab coat, you listen to them generally, right? The gun industry person shows up in real tree t-shirt mm -hmm. and a John Deere hat. And you kind of go, I would take that guy's advice on what brake discs to buy. 
You know, mm-hmm. like it's it's just a fundamental. If, wear a suit. Wear a tie. Be the kind of person that people aspire to be. Don't be the kind of person that always has to argue for your existence. Like, how much different... We always use the Swiss example, right? Everyone goes, oh, the Swiss. Everyone got a gun in Switzerland. Everyone would probably like to be Swiss. Why? Because they have a shitload of money. <laughs> They've never been in a law. Their country's pretty much as good as it gets in terms of, like, good outcomes for the people who live there. It got there because... People strived to make it better. They didn't strive to continuously oppose the other people. I mean, that's the. I mean, that's fundamentally my big problem. Is it's just we've entered this new era of oppositional stuff, and it's no one's building anything anymore. Everyone's just tearing stuff down. So, what do you see the best direction is to go when you're engaging people on social media? Just factual stuff. I mean, in in my own personal case, that doesn't seem to work in a lot of. A lot of ways, like you can, you can lay out the facts and you can lay it all straight out and you can be polite and professional and away you go. And they still, I would dump in all the ridiculous stuff that, you know. Well, that's trying to fight emotion with fact. It's really what it is. Yeah. I guess we need to find a way to fight the emotion with our own emotion. Uh, I think it's also too, like there's multiple forms of capital out there, right? Like you got, you got your time, you got your money, you got all these things at your disposal that you can do. Right. Um, and maybe it's just having a kid recently, but I mean, laying on your deathbed, will responding to the doctors for protection from guns on Twitter be the time you appreciate having spent? Like, <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and I think that's where it comes down to. Um, it's, it's just some people can't be convinced, first off. So there's, there's certain, like, there's, there's definitely a point in, at this point. I think it's it's certainly safe to say the pro-gun side of social media commands a far larger audience than the anti-gun side. Mm. And the pro-gun side needs to recognize... I mean, you'll recognize that Caliber pretty much never, ever, ever interacts with anyone anti-gun on Twitter or Facebook or any other place because when the Doctors for Protection from Guns had 300 followers on Twitter and Caliber has tens of thousands of people on Facebook, why the hell would I promote them? Like why? Mm-hmm. Even if they say the stupidest thing, like yeah, I could. This is what happens because again, people don't see this. If you look on the insight side, and we'll probably, I might do my own, maybe video cast or stream or something on this to show people the back mm-hmm. end of what social media websites look like to see what works on social media. What gets traction on social media is outrage. Absolutely, the way the algorithms work, it, yeah. they sure conflict. Yeah. Yeah, and again, so for way of explanation to those listening in, the algorithms on social media are the things that decide what you are shown, right? Like your friends post, you know how sometimes on Facebook you'll see some things from one guy and not other things? It's the algorithm deciding what you're supposed to see. It decides based on what gets lots of feedback. Now, what usually gets lots of feedback is things that have high emotional attachments, i.e. things people hate or things people love. As a result, when I put up a post on Facebook saying, hey, look at this really great new gun, it's awesome. Like a great example would be... um, the first modern sporter, which was the first kind of non-restricted thing that was similar enough to an AR-15, that got like 120,000 impressions on Facebook within the first day, maybe thereabouts. That was a big, that was a big deal. Mm-hmm. Um, that video I did on C21 got 130,000 impressions in the first three hours. Mm. Everything political, everything to do with the debate, yeah. always gets the most likes. So. Yeah, I could have absolutely shared a bunch of doctor stuff. I could have shared a bunch of anti-gun stuff. And I could have gotten a whole shitload of Facebook likes and impressions. And it would have expanded Caliber's social media presence. But it also would have expanded the social media presence of those anti-gun groups. Mm -hmm. Which I do actually think we are seeing a bit of the aspect of now. Those doctors for protection from guns was literally one person with a Twitter account initially. Now they have 300,000 or 200,000 hours from Airbnb. And... Like they've expanded, they've they've eclipsed both of the other groups. And when you look at the only thing that's different between doctors and the other anti-gun groups, it's that doctors has been engaged more with the with the pro-gun groups. Mm, interesting. They choose to. They both do. The, the pro-gun groups engage the doctors, and the doctors engage the, the anti-gun groups, or pro, vice versa. This is getting very complicated, <laughs> but you know what I'm saying. Um, the doctors are engaging, and it's and they're everyone is feeding off it because it does. I think on both ends, I think people are seeing social media growth and they're interpreting that as success when Twitter still hasn't made a profit, you know? Mm. Social media is only social media. It's not It's not actual legislation. We. I don't think a gun owner out there would say we've made progress on gun rights in the last five years. You know, it's not, we haven't. Um, we have 
I think, inadvertently propped up the creation of anti-gun groups or made them stronger. I think we have done a disservice and, and lowered the discourse that we have. And I think that as a result, we, we do stand to potentially be ostracized from the political parties that stand to hold power in the future. Because unless we start to look like, we always like to say we're the best Canadians, mm -hmm. but we got to act like it. And I think that involves recognizing that like when you hear these stories about these gun laws and stuff, I hate to say it, but you do have to think if they want to take my AR-15, how would I explain why I should keep my AR-15 to the mother of a kid who was shot? Hmm. Is I think what gun owners need to think about because there's a mom out there who's thinking that. And if that was my kid or if that was anyone's kid, I think, I think we can probably see that emotionally my kid was shot and I want guns off the street would be two very easy dots to connect. Um, and I think that because those dots are easy to connect, it's why people do. I don't think it's logically consistent and I don't, I don't think it's, I don't think it's good for our country. I think it's, our, I think it's hurting our young people at this point and it's increasing violence to not focus on the real problems. But again, I think gun owners need to think that before they type something out on Facebook or they say some smart ass comment about how libtard snowflake, this or that think, you know, there are parents out there who are losing their kids. There are families that are losing loved ones to suicide. And simply saying, well, stop targeting me. That doesn't make you feel better when your kid was shot. That doesn't make you feel like like your kid's friends are going to be safer. You know, we got to give these people hope. We need to show them that we care. And it's, we got to get there somehow. And it's not going to be by continuously, I hate to say it because I have been a member of the NRA. My membership lapsed only because I let it and the magazines stopped coming. But um, we can't. We, we, we're not the NRA. We're not Americans. Mm. We don't have a Second Amendment. Um, we do have a Westminster parliamentary system. We do not live in a republic. All those same reasons the Canadian gun owners like to say we're different than the U.S. We don't have the U.S. gun violence problem, et cetera, et cetera. All those differences um, are also the same differences that prevent us from effectively deploying US style arguments because US style arguments hinge around that rights, the Second Amendment, that's their that's their real foundation, which we just fundamentally lack. So if we're coming at it with the argument and we're bringing in that US style rhetoric, we don't have the foundation for that to stand up on. It's essentially, it's building a house on quicksand. Mm. You know? um, it looks really good and people think it's great, right up until one legislator goes, you don't have a right. This whole right was never a right you know, you have a legal responsibility of all these other things. And we have, because the other thing too, is it's, we have a, we don't have a right to own guns, but the government does have a legal right to uphold the law. The law states that they can't just take shit away if it's going to reduce, you know, the amount of hunting, if guns can be used for hunting, if it can reduce culture, you know, all those things. We want them to abide by their responsibilities. I think we also have to have a certain degree of respect for our responsibilities and what those are. And it's, it's to show people we, we are safer. We do care, you know. Man, you've brought up a lot of stuff. You went really macro on this one. Uh, I really like what you have to say on this because I agree. I agree with what you're saying. Um, I, it was an eye opener for me a number of years ago, corporation of Delta before as a city of Delta says, we're going to ban firearms businesses. And I went into the city hall, municipal hall there and had all my notes prepared, had all my arguments and statistics and everything all, all ready to present. And as I'm going through it, I uh, forget the fellow's name, Barry, I believe it was, uh, he says, Travis, I'm going to stop you right there. Hold on a second. You've, you've got a lot more of this stuff. I said, oh yeah, I sure do. Right. He says, you got to understand. I agree with you hundred percent. Everything that you're saying is true. And I agree with you. That said, we're in a position where if we think our, our constituents want something, that we'll take steps to implement that, whether we agree with the facts behind that or not. And that, that level of honesty, and we're going back about 10, 15 years now, and it's a little bit younger. It was quite an eye opener for me. And when you, when you talk about, uh, how to properly comport yourself in an argument on social media, you know, there's some simple steps that I typically take when I look at an issue, I try to separate the people from the problem. I take a look at what the problem is, take a look at the person and as angry as I can be at that individual or group of people who are making certain statements because they're completely off base, at least in my opinion, I do my best to separate them and take a look at addressing the problem. If I can't separate the people from the problem, I extricate myself because there's, there's no way to be able to properly 
work within that framework. The second thing I do is I agree, essentially any offense is taken and not given. If they say something as crappy as it can be, and as much as they're trying to offend and get my goat, it's me who ultimately will you take that power. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's that old adage and you see it on TikTok and these different things. People are bringing it up again. A guy gives you a present, but you don't accept it. Who's that present belong to? Well, not to you, right? Yeah. Belongs to the person who brought it in. And, and finally, I'll do my best to approach a problem from a position of curiosity rather than conflict. So when you're talking about how, how do you convince a mother whose child was killed by an AR-15? I can put my mindset in all the statistics and say, oh, it wasn't a firearm and we should be con combating, uh, violence or what, however it took place, whether it was a stray bullet from gangs and so we should be looking at gangs or whether it be suicide because suicide is a, uh, largest killer of people with firearms in Canada. We can say, I'll oh, just look at the suicide. They can get a knife, they can get pills, they can get a rope put myself in a position of curiosity. What would it be like to be that individual and who have gone through that? Cause maybe there's nothing you can say to that person. I think at a lot of the time, there's nothing you can say. It's right. not even but worth your job, the argument. Right. Your job's not to say anything. That's it. And I think that's the fundamental thing is like. Exactly. Like Ryan, you've got kids, right? Like you, yep. if your if your son was killed, is there anything, anyone, anyone, I don't care if it's the president of the United States, anyone, is there anything anyone could say to you? to soothe that? The answer is no, right? Like there's nothing anyone can say to make a mother feel better. Right. It's not our job to make her feel better. What our job is to do as gun owners is to show her that we are being responsible. So it's not saying, you know, it's not saying I should keep my air. Cause we, I do see it. Like literally there is a very, there's a high profile. She's very emotional. Like she's tied into the anti-gun movement. She will likely never change her mind, but she's the, she's the mother of a, of a son that was killed in a gang murder and it's tragic. Um, and, and I, I think it's, I think what's happened to this one is, is off or, or sorry, a daughter. Um, Lindsay's mom is her name on Twitter. I'll just say it. I mean, she's on Twitter, so everyone knows it. She's a staunch anti-gun person. She, she posts quite prolifically. Um, I've purposely tried to avoid engaging her because I can't, I don't know how to frame that discussion. I don't know how to talk to someone that, that has lost their child like that. I don't know how to say, Who does? but I would say, you ask the question. If you, if they say, you know, I want you to get rid of your AR-15 because it'll help prevent murders you say like well, well why like what you know what what do you think is causing these murders and you ask questions because the big thing is is there's 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 you can be on broadcast or you can be on receive right like people are generally we're the old cb radio system we don't do two-way so well right and when you get into a conversation with someone it's it's natural it's very natural that people want to talk about themselves look at me i've spent most of this podcast talking because i am the most verbose person in this industry bar none proud to say I something. would agree. <laughs> <laughs> Happy to say it. Um, I'm fairly certain people don't take my calls because I talk too long. But nonetheless, um, at the end of the day, like you just don't have that, like you have to ask questions and people are so much on broadcast because in the modern social media world, that's all it is. That's what, brought, like, when people talk about Twitter, people rarely talk about the things they've read on Twitter unless it's the things they've interacted with because social media is a broadcast thing for most people. It's how they express themselves. They express themselves on Facebook. They express themselves on Twitter. And then occasionally they see how other people express themselves. And because of the algorithm, they only see the people they hate and the people they love express themselves in manners they hate and they love. Um, and the problem there is that between the torquing of the messaging by the algorithms that people don't see, because that's behind the curtain, a bit of that you know Wizard of Oz sort of effect, but also too, just the overwhelming sense of uh, the bubbles that are created because that algorithm creates um, echo chambers. Bubbles. Yeah. Echo chambers. Yeah, exactly. Very good echo chambers. So you basically just get surrounded by people that like what you have to say and that say similar things. So you naturally start to like what you have to say more and more. So when you enter these conversations with a mom, instead of instead of thinking, because I think in most cases, if you were to ask the average person that doesn't own guns to sit down in a room and have a conversation with a parent who'd lost a child. Most of them would say, I would have a lot of questions. I don't mm -hmm. think they'd have much to say because most people wouldn't feel like they would have much appropriate input on that scenario because admittedly it's such a tragic occurrence. that unless you've gone through it, I don't think you can really provide much input. So most people would go, I'd be very curious. To, you'd probably find it on a videotape. They asked more questions. What was it like? How did you get through it? What were the first days like? You know, do you think you'll ever have another, all these questions that you would want to ask? Mm -hmm. I don't know why gun owners immediately, it's because of the victimization. We do have that. I think it's innate. We have, we've kind of 
wrapped ourselves in this cloak of victimhood of mm -hmm. we're being targeted by the government, we're being targeted by the government. And it's and because the laws that they pass are always created because someone was shot. Like people were killed in Porta Peak that did not deserve to die. Gun owners have allowed the perpetrator of that shooting and the nature by which he obtained his guns to completely dictate the manner in which they respond to that event. And I think fundamentally, if people take anything away from the podcast, that's what I want them to stop doing. Because when you can watch that many people get killed in a short window of time for no goddamn reason, and your response is, but my guns, you need to take mm -hmm. a hard look, seriously. As someone that works in the gun industry who, who flat out, I've been doing this for 10 years. I'm looking at potentially if the liberals win the next election. I'm not sure if my business will survive. And yes, this is my voice breaking that you're hearing because it's incredibly hard to talk about. But even as someone that's considering losing this much of what I've put my life into, if someone were to say, hey, would you give up your AR-15 if it saves everyone's life on that day in Porta Peak? Absolutely. How can you not? Mm -hmm. Those are Those are sisters and brothers and friends, you know, like... I think we as gun owners have lost a bit of the, the perspective and we need to get back around all that. Well said, Daniel. Nice. That said, I don't think giving up AR-15 would save anyone's life, just for the record. <laughs> um, I think what would save lives is good government and I think that's where we, it gets problematic because I say that and I get very emotional because it is very saddening and I think that's the perspective we need to come at it from because it tempers the anger. It tempers the frustration that I feel because I sat there, I'll confess, I was a gun owner that sat there on the on my couch on May 1st and thought, why is he doing this to me? I never thought about those people. I think we all did. Hmm. It gets, it, it's a knee jerk, not right? to. It's in the days that happen afterwards, but in the days that happen afterwards is when the rhetoric picks up and that's when we need to be cautious of that rhetoric and say no. Like when they say, I think when you hear about these shootings and when people say we need to let the dust settle before we make comments and stuff, this is why. Because in those first few minutes, everyone's reacting to emotional inputs. You know, people are watching it and going, those people are, I don't know those people. It, it's the same as when there's a tornado in Idaho. There's no tornadoes in Idaho. Iowa? Iowa. Kansas? That's where tornadoes occur, yeah. Uh, floods in New Orleans. Like a lot of people look at the headlines and they think it's similar. That's people elsewhere. It's not my problem. But when Justin Trudeau bans my guns, that is my problem. Um, but the problem then becomes when that rhetoric takes over the pro-gun side of the debate, we then enter it from, to be honest, kind of a morally bankrupt perspective. Because it's really, as someone that sat across the table from media interviewers and had to defend why I don't think these gun laws work, the only reason I can say is because it's it's wasting resources. Like it's, these resources could be spent on actual progress. And I think that argument is the only argument that matters. And I think that argument would be a hell of a lot stronger if more of our movement would take into account that like shit's bad out there, folks. Yeah. Like young people are shooting each other and shooting at each other more than they did when I was a kid. That's for freaking sure. And I'm 35 years old. I'm not that old. Like I grew up when Tupac Shakur died, you know, like this is more violent than then. Well, um, I'm, I'm not going to discount the fact that there probably are some people out there who will look at it and say, not my guns and completely write off the tragedy yeah. that's happening out there. But I think it might be a little disingenuous to say that gun owners in general, their head immediately goes to the firearm issue from a perspective of, uh, what are they taking from me? And I think the outrage that is felt from the community, the, those, the victims, those directly involved and the firearms industry in general is outrage over the event, empathy and compassion for what's going on and further outrage over the fact that as firearms owners, most of them will have done their homework and have an idea of what the statistics look like and have a better idea of what could possibly be done to prevent tragedies like this. And they see that the knee jerk reaction of let's just ban guns will do nothing yep. to stop the tragedy that happened. And that can create a, a higher sense of anger, but I don't think firearms owners are properly conveying that it comes across as, yeah, don't take my guns as opposed to what the hell you think that we're going to, if we, let's say we've got a problem with suicide, suicide men will predominantly use firearms. Women will predominantly use pills. People have their preferred methods, but if we don't have that implement, we don't have that instrument of implementation, would that person just find another instrument? 
and maybe we should be the tried and beaten that old drum. Why don't we address what the actual problem is? So I, I think, I think that the, I think the anger is there, but I agree with you that the way that we're, and I say we're, cause I put myself in with the firearms community, yep. obviously the way that we're conveying that anger and conveying our message needs a lot of work because it's so easily misconstrued and becomes positional yep. down to the firearm issue, as opposed to solution issue. How yep, can we find sure, a solution? For sure. I agree. And I think, um, the only thing I would say there is I think, I, I don't think the majority of gun owners, I'll, I'll just say, it, I don't think the majority of gun owners are on our side on this one. Hmm. Um, specifically the assault weapon ban. I would have thought that. And this is where it's been interesting moving because I moved out of Delta uh, four years ago now, mm -hmm. coming up on five. Um, and when I lived in Lower Mainland, it, Abbotsford, like Ryan knows he lives Lower Mainland, like Lower Mainland shooting community is predominantly a sporting community. You've got the trap guys at Vancouver Gun Club. Yep. Abbotsford is like the center for all the tactical shooting type stuff. You got Ipsic all over the place. Poco's big on it. Like there's lots of AR-15s. There's lots of handguns. There's lots of trap shotguns. It's all sporting stuff, right? And hunting is kind of the, a bit more of the minority because you got to drive like three hours to shoot an animal in Lower Mainland. Mm. Um, unless you unless you're from ducks. Delta like Travis does. <laughs> and then it's hard. like five minutes from your house. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so... Then when I moved up to Kelowna, it was this weird inversion, which I noticed right away because I was, I used to go to like Reliable Gun and Wand Stalls and, and those sorts of shops. And it was just a, a sea of, you know, tactical stuff and ammunition and 223 and bulk stuff and handguns. And then I came to Kelowna and the gun clubs here, like Kelowna has, Kelowna Fishing Game has an Ipsic range. It's never been used to my knowledge, not since I moved. The Joe Rich Club, I was one of two people with an AR-15 in the club when I first joined it hmm. in the second largest metropolitan center in British Columbia in the second largest gun club. When I took my AR-15 to the Kelowna fishing game club, some guy didn't even know what it was. Like there's no gun. If you tried to buy an SKS off the shelf in Kelowna, you can't do it right now. Hmm. There is no SKS. There's no AR-15. Well, obviously no AR-15s, but there's like <laughs> maybe double digits of handguns for sale in this entire city of six figures, like quarter million people in this metro area. It's insane. And I think that's where, also, too, gun owners need to recognize there's a disconnect, and I think that that the the rural gun owner does not care, by and large. And this is a gross generalization, so please do not email me with your "I'm a rural <laughs> gun owner who cares" because the exceptions always prove the rule, folks. <laughs> by and large, if you were to drive through rural Canada and knock on the doors of people with pals and say, "Do you care about the Air 15?" they go, "The what?" Because it's just not. If, because fundamentally, when you think about it, the AR-15 is a restricted firearm. It can only be shot on ranges. If you live in rural Canada, where's the nearest gun range? Mm -hmm. Probably hours away, right? Mm -hmm. What's the nearest competition to shoot your AR-15 in? Hours away, if not yeah. days, depending on where mm -hmm. you live and where you're driving, right? I think we're starting so to when see a bit of a change with the uh, non-restricted versions of things. Oh, that are a coming little bit. In. We're and starting that's to what bleed we were in. For sure, we were seeing that in Kelowna big time yep. as we were, the non-restricted stuff was finally opening people's eyes up because where yeah. you lack the infrastructure for AR-15s to be beneficial, the STAGs, the NEAs were showing people these are perfectly viable modern yeah, firearms totally. that weigh seven pounds that are more accurate than your bolt gun that allow you yep. a better follow-up shot that you can make fit your wife. Yep. Mm, so yeah, exactly. it's it was growing, but they've cut that off at the knees. And I think that's where, again... I go for the macro views because people do need to look at these policies. People need to look at gun control in Canada from like a 10 year scale, not a like C21, C71, all these bills the last few years. What's the only thing that's mattered? Travis and I, before the podcast, we mentioned it, the end of the long gun registry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The single most important thing that's happened in our lifetime, well, my lifetime anyways, I mean, was that. The long gun registry was created in my lifetime, but I was so young, I don't count it. I couldn't change anything then. I was 10. Mm -hmm. Um <laughs> But that's the only thing that's mattered. And ever since then, they've just been kind of fiddling with things. C21, I'll be honest. Bad bill, terrible bill. Hope it doesn't pass. If it passes, how many guns are they going to get back? Well, we'll get the AR-15s back because they know where those ones are. Yeah. The people that want to give them back will give them back and get a check. There's, what, 150,000 of those, 120,000 AR-15s out there. I got to figure they don't get more than maybe 10% back mm. in the buyback. I can't see more. AR-15 owners are pretty staunch guys uh, and most of them will have handguns too so they'll have a reason to keep their restricted license already so the endorsement's not really going anywhere. And, you know, we'll all just wait for the next government change and it's that, you know, 
That's where I say gun owners kind of need to stop making it about ourselves and about the guns we're losing and about the gun policies from our perspective and start thinking as like, we are the experts on firearms in Canada. You know, these are the laws as they currently work. These ones clearly aren't. Like, I think gun owners could seriously, like, we always say, like, oh, gangbangers, look at they, they don't, they don't have gun licenses because they don't have an ATT. Instead of saying, the ATT is clearly not working. Because mm-hmm. we have this system by which we're supposed to be authorizing the transport of firearms, and there seems to be a whole shitload of people moving firearms around the country without ATTs. Mm-hmm. We know this because they keep shooting each other with them. Mm-hmm. So instead of saying like there's a public safety concern and that the ATT system is not fulfilling the role it was supposed to, we use the laws that we hate to prop up why we're better than the people that are shooting each other as evidence of, oh, look, we're, we're, that's a different population of people. They don't have this fancy plastic card in our wallets. They're not us. They didn't get ATTs. When in reality, the ATT doesn't do anything. So why are we – like it's convenient for us. It doesn't mean it's good. It costs a fortune for the government to maintain the ATT stuff when they could spend more on cops. And that's where, like, we need to be consistent. It's always got to be with the safety. Anytime we see there to be room for improvement on safety, we should be doing it. And that includes, you know, things like we've seen the CS AAA do with industry, cracking down on um, fraudulent purses and, like, doing mm. working with mm. – uh, so the Canadian Industry Group worked with the RCMP to develop uh, basically like a sort of quasi-training program to help train ed- uh, retailers on recognizing straw purchases. And, like, that's a great – that's – that's worked. I know there are cases where people have been arrested because they were straw purchasing firearms and that purchase was identified because of the training that the employee received. And that was a hand in glove industry law enforcement working together. And like that happened in like, I think it was like a six month, it was a fast program and it made results. Hmm. And like, man, if we had more of that, there'd be a lot less people getting shot. Well, but again, it all has to be from that perspective of safety first. It's all, it's yeah. all about safety because, as you know, when you talk to the city councils, politicians only care about what the voters told them to do um, and safety. Like, what's safe? When I talked to Stephen Blaney when he was the public minister, it was always – he never really talked about gun policy. It was always safety policy. It was always – everything was from a safety perspective. It was mm-hmm. never – like, politicians never think from a gun owner's perspective or about gun clubs. It's always as a larger – guns in a safety environment which is what the liberals are pushing right now they're they're talking about guns but it's always backed by a safety some yep. sort of a safety thing and so. when we're arguing and when they're arguing they should get rid of guns to make us safer an argument is don't take our guns away that's a pretty shitty argument for the guy on the sideline is it not yeah. like we need to be saying this isn't going to make us safer. this is the you reason to why this to make us safer, it's not going to be you know? safer yeah. um but because it's literally like, I think Travis, you're entirely right. It's not that we need to change the argument. We just need to change the order of operations in the argument because when we start the conversation with don't take our guns, they think that's the priority. Mm-hmm. And the conversation has to start with, we want people to be safe. So when you're talking to those people, that's the other thing is if you're talking to people, if you're getting a tip and people are trying to figure out how to talk to people, tell the FUDs that it's going to be the end of all the gun clubs because reg- restricted owners make up what keeps gun clubs in the black and tell the anti-gun people that fundamentally like this isn't going to work obviously and all that kind of thing, but tell them this distraction. Tell them there's only 55 days left. Tell them it's the middle of a pandemic. Tell them that the IBM, so the other thing on timing, if anyone needs further evidence to convince people, the IBM contract that was awarded for the um, planning out of the buyback, uh, the preliminary report was delivered the week before the law was announced. So like literally five business days at most between mm. IBM delivering the preliminary report, which was a $200,000 document, I think that took five weeks. So it's not comprehensive in any way. And this preliminary report that Bill Blair took from IBM that I'm guessing informed Bill C-21 uh, has an option where to, once they've completed the initial report and the government has given them direction on which specific model to go for, that the overall um, enrollment of the program will take an additional two years. Mm. So like they were saying, this was supposed to be a two year, five week project. And now he's saying, we're going to have a law ready, like legislation passed in 40 days, mm. like, or, or conversely, we're not going to an election in the fall. And the liberals think that after this pandemic, that they're going to be somehow be able to maintain and retain their mandate after the vaccine stuff, after everything else, it just doesn't seem likely. Mm. And then again, thinking from the political perspective, it would be great if the concern, like 
if I was a liberal political strategist, I would look at this and go, this is great. We'll get this thing real close to the finish line. And just when the anti-gun people think it's in the bag, we'll pull the old Lucy football trick and we'll say, drop that ballot in the ballot box, baby, and we'll see how she rolls again. Mm -hmm. So, And I think also two gunners on that front need to kind of understand the political pastoring that occurs here and understand that it may change the way the conservative party or other parties confront these issues. Um, if the media jumps all over it and starts making it look like these assault weapons have to get off the street, if there's some massive shooting that puts guns in a bad light again, you can fully expect Aaron O'Toole to absolutely not make any statements about guns between now and the election, because why would he? Like, mm -hmm. I'm a little surprised he did came up with that video the other day. Yeah, I, we won't, I'm not... Uh, I thought he would stay a little more quiet on the whole thing. Because the reality is, is they have to pull the middle voters over, right? And I know people want to want them to come out and say all kinds of stuff, but the reality of it is, is if you want to pull those middle voters over, um, you have to be a little more centrist than. And it's been extremely frustrating, I gotta say. And I and I hope if someone from the conservative party is listening to this, please, dear Jesus God, please, like get someone that knows about guns into the OLO to help out with policy and messaging on this yeah. because I mean from from Harper to to Shear to now the conservative party's messaging on guns has basically been everything I've complained about today mm. wrapped up in a nutshell and paid for yeah. mm. because that's what it is conservative party members are paying for communication staff and policy experts to draft the policy and communications that we have seen from this party on guns and that's where I will say like Again, it'll probably piss people off, but it's 2021. Some shit went down last year where we're, things are different, and I've got a kid now, so that's changed my perspective too. But uh, I'm I'm getting really frustrated because I mean those those conservative party I mean, they work for us. Let's not forget everyone forgets these politicians. They kind of we get the impression that they kind of represent the party in Ottawa in our ridings. It's supposed to be the other way around, and uh, I'm just getting kind of tired of this constant, like, we'll tell you what our policy is going to be. And then me getting it and being like, what the, f this isn't even good. Like mm. I get the whole, like trying to achieve the voting, like get the, get the gun vote out. I, that's what the goal always is in politics. But like, I don't know. Some of the, it's just, it's just been, it's like the common sense firearms licensing act where it's just like, dude, come on guys. Like if you're going to open the books, open the books, you know, do something, mm -hmm. do something right. Make a substantive change so that we can look at a, out of violent crime rate statistic that is declining and say, yeah, we were part of the solution, you know? Mm. And address um, the root causes that actually are going to have an effect instead of. And that's the thing is I, Aaron's statement I thought was, it's a very strong, strong statement. Um, surprised me. Yeah. Uh, I think it's a good statement. I think it's all good law. I mean, obviously, yeah, rewrite all that stuff, but I mean, we don't know how to be rewritten. Um, that's always a concern is Peter McKay said he was going to rewrite the firearms act. And you always go a little bit of like, Oh, Justin Trudeau said he rewrote the firearms act. I might respond to that a bit differently than if Aaron O'Toole does, but you should probably question that at the same time mm -hmm. as a rational person. Mm -hmm. Um, cause they can rewrite good or bad. But the other thing is, um, it's just, it's, yeah, it's that lack of, I don't know, lack of productivity, I guess. Just, it's frustrating to, to be sitting on the sidelines and say like, Hey, you know, there's a lot of things you could do that would frame the gun discussion in a much more positive light. And I don't mean that for the anti-gun groups that are listening to that and thinking I'm going to spin that into a thing. What I mean by that is like, like Ryan said, address the cause. Instead of mm -hmm. saying, I'm, I'm going to roll back all this stuff to gun owners, like instead of putting a video out for the gun community, the video should have been to the general Canadian population, yeah, Justin exactly. Trudeau is going to spend probably between two and five billion of your tax dollars buying guns for act from people that don't commit crimes. I would like to spend that money standing up a mental health system. Yep. Mm -hmm. There, you know. Yep, or stronger borders or more policing, <sighs> anti-gang units. Like there's a giant list of stuff that could be done. But that's again where a lot of the messaging on them recently, I got to say, I don't understand it in general for politics at large. Things like when the vaccine, like Aaron O'Toole was saying, we're at the end of the line for vaccines. And then everyone was like, no, you're wrong. And then it came out, he was right. And he never said, I told you so. Yeah. And that was one of those like fundamental, like you're a politician. You have to say, I told you so. Mm -hmm. like it's, you know, it's your job. It's, that's literally what opposition does. Hold the government to account. If you were correct, you know, weeks before the government, own it. Say, yeah, we were right. You know, we said this was going to be a problem. And guess what? Start to show people. And I, I, I think that's the big thing is show people... 
This is where I, I guess fundamentally at that oppositional side of gun owners continuing saying it's all about the targeting, the victimization, we're gonna lose our guns, all that mm. kind of thing, is it the oppositional. Don't don't stop thinking that just because someone wants to take your AR fifteen away from you, they're not your ally. We're all Canadians. We all want to live in a safer country. So start off from that common ground. And if they want to maintain distance and they don't want to find common ground with you, then so be it. But be it an anti gun group or a politician, like I think the conservatives need to stop opposing and start saying what they do, how they lead. Like, same yeah, as gun owners. Stop exactly. saying, don't take Mayor 15. Start saying, spend the money on a mental health program. Spend the money on opioid addiction counseling. Mm -hmm. Spend the money on border patrol. Spend the money on drug interdiction. Spend the money on money laundering yep. investigations. Like, spend the money on any one of those other things. Mm -hmm. Then we can talk about the guns. Would be a way better discussion to have. And I just... Yeah. Everyone's just button heads. It's getting super partisan, man. I think it's almost better to almost ignore the gun thing and just uh, just aim towards the root causes of what's going on and how that they would fix it. And in turn, that's going to that's gonna fix the gun issues mm -hmm. in the end. Mm -hmm. uh, everybody's going to be happy. And the gun owners are going to know that if you, if you achieve those things that you're promising to do, that in the end, everybody's going to be safer and the gun folks will more than likely still have what they what they have. And I think like, if, if I think that's a good perspective for people to have is if you were to think like what you said, Ryan, about if gun owners were, were striving for a safer Canada, if Canada's gun homicide rate was single digits, there is no government that could justify spending any amount of taxpayer dollars yeah. pulling guns out of civilian hands. So gun owners should be striving for that number to drop too. Um, Obviously, there's the law of diminishing returns, so it does get really hard. Once we're at, I mean, we're at 200 people on average. It's for a country of 32 million. It's a pretty small number for very small. murders. But I think, too, you know, when these bad things happen, what you said, Ryan, kind of spawned a bit of a thought in my head of like this, what I've talked about with regards to gun owners thinking a little bit beyond the scope of their gun safe when they see these headlines is um, I'm a young guy that, who sadly is you know, like I said, growing up in this 90s, 2000s generation of school shootings, Columbine was during my childhood, mm -hmm. and I grew up in a era of just constant school shootings, pretty much. Um, they're not the gun's fault. I always get media interviews where, okay, well, what does this have to do with guns is always the response, because it doesn't have anything to do with guns. Because if a kid wants to shoot up a school, they'll find some other thing to do. You know, Timothy McVeigh, or you name it, is yeah. a common... I, I, I honestly do, like, if a kid's going to grab a 12-gauge and shoot another kid, I don't know, like, I'm not the guy to, to say, you know, what do you do? That kid needs mental help, not, like, not to take his shotgun away. Like, <laughs> like taking a kid's shotgun away, he's still going to try and kill another kid, so it's a little weird. Um, yeah. But what I've always thought is, like, all of the... So I don't associate with that as a gun owner, but I do associate with that as a young man because I've never seen a mass shooting perpetrated by a young woman. And... That's where I've, that, that thought, I don't know when I had, I think it was a few years ago that it suddenly occurred to me. And I thought, you know, um, it was when Courtney and I were talking about having our first kid and it, you inevitably think, well, what if I have a son, you know, and mini me kind of thoughts. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you think about what's going on with the kids these days. And I have concerns about TikTok like everyone else, but then you see these shootings and you think young men uh, might be in a certain, really? so, some, some young men clearly find themselves in a, in a state of very clear distress. Um, and obviously while the school shootings themselves are, are super, super sad, I think that, and it's, it's obviously very hard to think about the perpetrators as victims themselves, but I think fundamentally it, as someone that has a background in mental health, you do have to look at that and realize that. Like if, if anyone's wondering, just go watch a prison documentary and tell me you don't feel bad for the guy who was abused sexually from the age of three to 16 and then entered a life of crime because he's never known a life of normalcy, mm. right? Like you have to feel sorry for these people. They, they were not given the opportunities that some of us were. Um, and I think it's the same thing goes on with the gangbangers in Toronto and Vancouver is it's, they're not doing it because they've got a great job and they're like, man, I really don't like my boss at this cushy nine to five. I'm going to go sell drugs. Like mm, yeah. that's not really how it goes most of the time. So keeping in mind, you know, when a gun enters a violent situation, there's no one winning. And chances are there was no one winning when that happened in the first place. Mm. Um, it was just a bunch of people who are trying to find a way to win and don't know how. And I think it's, it's on all of us to help them out. Well, Daniel, Ryan, I've got a bunch of notes that I had taken just on C21 alone, some C71, some on the OAC. 
And I much prefer where this conversation went. I think it was you much- want to bomb through it quick? I'll, I got a 20 second, let's hammer through yellow flags. I can just, you, you tell her to say the word, I'll give her, man. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Giving her the whole time. I, I was, I was going to throw it up on the website and I still might do that as well. Just a, a quick synopsis so people can look at it. Of course, on the Silvercore blog, we have complete transcripts knowing full well that some people would prefer to read or watch or listen, but Hey. You know what, Daniel, if you want, uh, we've got a real quick list here, red flag, yellow flag, turning your guns during a legal challenge, replica firearms, uh, deletion and replacement of grandfathering municipal firearms bans, uh, ammo individuals without a firearms license cannot obtain ammo abroad, uh, mag capacity, uh, new, uh, terms for, uh, unpinned magazines. Um, mail order transfers and centralized authorization to carry. So no longer the CFO, now a central commissioner, because we know the CFOs are run off their feet, giving out, uh, authorization to carry, right? For, mm -hmm. uh, uh, so that those are the main bullet points I have. Uh, I did have one interesting thought on, on replicas, cause that touches on a lot of people who are into airsoft and some paintball. And, and that's, that's closer to your, that there's a bit of a Venn diagram overlap with your, some of your background training and stuff too. There isn't earth. Perhaps some a little bit. Things. You're talking okay. about disabled, deactivated, active, destroyed. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I've got uh, a little bit of authority to be able a to speak on, 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 on these ones. Yep. Um, in fact, I'm sitting in this podcast studio, which was once my office, we've had the, um, uh, some very high ranking people from the firearms program, uh, having some discussions on this, who flew in specifically from back East to talk on it. I remember one individual who, uh, suddenly couldn't speak anymore when, uh, she noticed that there were cameras in the office. Cause we are a security related, related business yeah. and, uh, tried to conduct the entire meeting through hand gestures, <laughs> but, uh, it was, it was interesting, but did you want to, uh, <laughs> <laughs> freaking heck man. Like. <laughs> and I still have that video, I'm sure nice. kicking around somewhere. <laughs> um, the puppet show. So yeah. Did you have any on, on those things? Did you have any, I mean, obviously abrogating control of the handgun issue from the feds to the municipalities has some huge Same. constitutional I don't, I, like, I don't, issues and, and I don't it can bleed over into other areas that are not oh, even yeah. firearms. People right? don't even understand what's going to happen. I mean, that. like for those listening, fundamentally the constitutional problem with this, and I'm not a lawyer, but I, I do know a constitutional lawyer. And my first call after this was to him. Hmm. Uh, fundamentally, your firearms license is a federal document, right? Like the federal government issued that to you. Right. And what it's, they call it is saying. Geographic extent, I think is the actual words that they use in the firearms act. Yeah. Right. And you can't see it, but I'm, I'm laughing and smiling because it's legitimately just a farcically comical portion of this law and that they want to have a federal license where your city council passes a bylaw that says you can't own a handgun. Or if you do, you have to have these special laws because like, they haven't said that municipalities can opt into an existing set of laws. They just said municipalities can make some laws. And whatever they say for handgun storage, possession, transport, you name it, they will put on your license as conditions making your bylaw a federal statute, essentially. Right. Because if they're going to enforce it on the back of your license, it's a federal condition on your federal license. And like, I don't think, I mean, if, I mean, A, like I said, I don't think any of this will happen. And I will say, so for the big synopsis, if people want to better run down on a lot of these things in detail, I can highly recommend. I like Ian Runkle's channel a lot, the YouTube mm -hmm. lawyer out there talking about this stuff. Um, the red flag law is terrible. It's just an extension of what's already out there as an existing system. I know within private RCMP Facebook groups, they don't like this because specifically uh, they don't actually like, RCMP frontline officers don't like the idea of going into your house and seizing stuff without a warrant because RCMP officers, they do have to go to court. They do have to testify on all these things and they look at it and go like, this is just going to get abused. They've all seen it. They know that this is just going to be abused by a bunch of people to ruin their ex-husband's deer season because yeah. newsflash, if they take your guns, now the new system is the, the red flag law. They take your guns away for 30 days while they do an investigation to find out if the supposed complaint levied against you from a public safety perspective was verified or not. The yellow mm. flag law is that you can't move your guns, use your guns, buy your guns, or sell your guns. They're parked in your house for 30 days while they conduct the investigation. 
The law in both cases allows for the 30-day period to be extended, I believe, once, and then an additional complaint will allow the courts to levy these penalties against you for a maximum of five years if the complaint is found justified. Now, obviously, that's different because the, then the courts decide. That's within the framework of the law, but 30 days, it's not judicial. Mm. There's no judicial oversight, and what that means is that if it happens to you, there's nothing you can do. You, there's nowhere to call. Um, Judicial oversight is when you can call a lawyer who can get you in front of a judge who can tell the government, this is illegal, you can't do this. There's nothing in this for that because you don't have a right to guns. So if the CFO says you can't have them for 30 days, you have no compensation. Um, That's obviously insane. Um, No one likes it. And this is where, again, I think people will find, you know, the advertising ban. It's poorly worded. It makes no sense. Um, The municipal handgun ban, unconstitutional and completely illegal and talk about like you want to talk about if anything the buyback is going to cost two to five billion maybe up to eight billion depending on how they count it i think the municipal bylaw ban could even eclipse that amount because the amount of lawyers that will have to be hired to figure out each individual case like is nuts um Mm. and i mean when you think like and i know that there are people oh no one's gonna sue i guarantee you if the shooting edge is going to be put out of business by a municipal hanging ban. The first <laughs> phone call J.R. Cox makes is to a freaking yeah. lawyer. Like, <laughs> you know, like everyone thinks about these laws from the perspective of individuals, but they forget that even with the buyback, you know, I have a decent amount of guns, but I'm probably not suing to keep them. A lawyer will cost me more than the guns are worth in some cases. Mm. I'm not North Silva. <laughs> so right. if North Silva's sitting on millions of dollars worth of Bushnell AR specific optics, Am I going to go after the government trying compensation? Yes, because it's probably easier to sue the government to get my full retail purchase price and taxes and duties and storage out of the government on those optics than it is to sell them. Because what do you put it on now, right? Um, so that shit's just going to go nuts. Um, I had a buddy that had an interesting point on the municipal handgun ban and driving out uh, conservative voters. Mm-hmm. So his thought was that uh, if you have a uh, like a purple riding or whatever that could go either way. And it would be easy enough for the government to say that, uh, or to uh, not implement, but uh, sort of point them in the direction to, hey, maybe you guys should implement a municipal handgun ban. So then the vo- the conservative voters at that point have choices. They can either get rid of their stuff or they can move. Uh, and if they end up moving, what happens to that riding? Well, the riding goes red. It almost gerrymanders in reverse. Yes. Mm. And so after, at that point, you're picking up seats in the house uh, because each one of those ridings is a seat and away we go. It certainly would increase the the partisanship. I mean, that rural urban divide and the east-west divide for sure. Yeah, for sure. And I think that relates to the, uh, what Travis mentioned about the, the centralized CFO thing for those that don't know, um, CFOs do have massive amounts of, of leeway when it comes to ATCs, um, as in like a CFO could just issue you one. You could, you could may issue or shall issue is potentially within reach within Canada. If a CFO decided it was, they would just have to make a personal decision and have a provincial government that didn't fire them for it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and I mean, the head of the Saskatchewan Wildlife Federation, I think it was Saskatchewan Wildlife Federation. There's two, the Saskatchewan Wildlife Federation, then another one. Uh, I believe it was him, Bob is his name. He's the current CFO of Saskatchewan. Um, He's obviously a gun guy, right? So uh, with, with Jason Kenney potentially hiring, I think that's what this is a response to Jason Kenney because there's been yeah. lots of talk about Jason Kenney hiring a provincial CFO. Yeah. Mm. So and that'll be two provinces that have. Well, and the big thing guys. I think the Trudeau's worry about is that Kenny is, Kenny and Alberta are the only province in a position right now to politically, Saskatchewan could, but they'd get crushed by the, Saskatchewan's not big enough to go up against the national media. So when the entire weight of Canada comes down on them going like, no, you shouldn't carry guns and Saskatchewan might acquiesce. Yeah. Um, but Alberta's not like that. And Alberta's got nothing to lose anymore. Um, <laughs> with all the pipeline stuff, yeah. like, uh, yeah. Trudeau has to be looking at it and going, Jason, like in the same way that Trudeau looks at this and goes, this is a great way to get votes, which is again, why I think it's reprehensible because to be clear, a 14 year old was shot in the face and Justin Trudeau's response was bill C21, which is never going to become a law. So instead of actually helping kids, he's decided to just use his votes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So not done nothing. That's the clear. So what pisses me off. He's done something. He's this done nothing he's to done. help. He's chosen to, to get votes. He's chosen. Right. Like he, he has the entire weight of the Canadian government and armed forces behind him. 
including our strongest ally being the United States. And he thinks the best way to stop kids from shooting each other in Toronto is taking away my gun, which is fucking bullshit. So in other words, he's choosing to use dead kids to get votes. That's mm-hmm. literally what it is. And I would challenge, I don't care if Rosemary Barton wants to do an interview with me, I would stick to my goddamn statement on that because mm-hmm. they ain't changing. You, you can't tell me otherwise. There's no justification for this. Bill Blair himself said as chief of Toronto police, municipal handgun bans don't make sense. Mm-hmm. You know, and now he's changing his tune because <laughs> it makes political sense. Sure. And I think, like, it's just, you know, ugh, I got all angry and lost my train of thought, but <laughs> it was good. It was good. We liked it. <laughs> <laughs> fucking Trudeau, man. Um, so, replica firearms. Mm-hmm. Replica firearms are prohibited already. It sounds like they're looking at some expansion to what is deemed a replica firearm. And that is to include airsoft. And so there's a whole slew of people out there that have never owned firearms and not interested in firearms in general. Right. And I guess people, some people listening to this will have a distinction and they'll think, well, a firearm is something that goes bang over 500 feet per second, 5.7 joules of energy. Mm -hmm. That's a regulated firearm. Airsoft pellet guns still fall under the firearm label. And if you use, uh, let's say a pellet gun to go and hold up your local liquor store, you will be charged with a firearms related offense, right? And then provincially firearms and municipally on the firearms side. So the, the concept here, I guess, is these guns that these, these items that kind of look like guns, we're going to just make the replica law a little bit more robust and of course, these guys are going to be affected by it. Guys and girls, of course, I shouldn't talk in the one way there, but I was thinking based on some of my experience I've had in the past dealing with different regulatory bodies, I actually can see a solution. Not that I would advocate for this, but the solution for the airsofters out there, if they still wanted to do airsoft would be to use real firearms. And let me explain what I mean by that. If something is developed, (laughs) (laughs) if something is developed as a firearm, it was never developed to imitate a firearm. It was a firearm. If you deactivate that, and now there are some guidelines for deactivation and you can exceed those guidelines and not be deemed deactivated or fall below it and be deemed deactivated, whatever you do, once it's deactivated in the eyes of the law, it is no longer a firearm. A yep. You then pull the guts out, throw some CO2 or green gas and the, uh, whatever you want inside yep. the thing. And you can run around and Away play airsoft go. again with what was originally designed to be a firearm. D- does that make logistical sense? No, but if you look at it from a, just a common sense perspective, Legal. the workaround for these people to go out here and to do it, yep. it's ridiculous. Yep. It, uh, and I think this is where the, it can be beneficial to take the 10 year perspective. Um, cause I'll admit, I, I, I have shot airsoft. I played airsoft when I was a young guy and it's tons of fun. Um, I think taking the guts out of real guns and de-wadding them, uh, I think it's a great argument because it really addresses the core cause of this, of if the problem is criminals running around with replica firearms and using them to intimidate people and police not knowing the difference because mm. legitimately they don't. That, I mean, right. these guns are very realistic. So sure. if the problem is coming from the law enforcement caucus in the liberal party, um, and it's people like Harjan Sajan getting, getting things from his XVPD guys, which I seriously doubt he is, but nonetheless, um, yeah. that could be what's steering this. If, if the practical solution for airsofters is, well, we'll just use real guns the gangbangers will be right behind them, right? Like mm-hmm. if, if a gangbanger goes, okay, so my airsoft gun that I used to steal from the airsoft store is no longer available. I guess I'll just go to the surplus store and steal that DWAT handgun that they've got hanging from the ceiling, right? Like, mm-hmm. or, or they'll just get a real gun or they'll just sure. new slash continue to trade in airsoft guns. Cause I mean, the big thing is there's, I, how many of these airsoft guns are out there? And mm-hmm. I got to say, like, I brought this up with the OIC. If they ban M14, say, right, they're not registered. So there is literally, and this is just reality, if a gangbanger goes into a gun store in rural Alberta and says, I will give you $8,000 for that M14, and I know it's illegal, just grind off the serial number, and that gun shop owner is going, well, Trudeau's just passed C21, my city might put me out of business, I could really use the eight grand right now. I'm going to eat all the money from all these. 
Yeah, right? Like you're putting people in between a rock and a hard place, and then yeah. basically you're putting them in a rock and a hard place that is also like front of the line for organized crime to take advantage of. So, I mean, if you don't think that that gangbangers and, and people that – criminals that would want to obtain these things for nefarious reasons don't go into airsoft for sale groups and buy airsoft guns for this reason, you're insane. Absolutely they do. Same as they do on any gun form. They're on CGN. They're everywhere trying to get guns. It's just the mm-hmm. fact that gun owners are generally pretty – um, fastidious with their with their documentation and checking pals that it, it's not really a problem. Yeah. So I think that's evidence the system works, but it's so weird to me that the government and the people that elected them that were like, I love these guys because they're going to make pot legal and then we can just stop that whole crime from happening and we can dedicate law enforcement resources to better crimes. And, you know, when you make something illegal and you prohibit it, it just makes it into the black market and we can't control that anyways. Look at prohibition. Are the same people that turn around and go, well, we'll make airsoft guns illegal. These made in made in China Chinese things that are dirt cheap that are imported by the million that are sold by companies like Walmart by the literally like Walmart orders hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of airsoft guns every calendar year, mm. and they think yeah we'll make those things illegal. A bunch of thirteen year olds turning in their Tokyo Marui Beretta ninety twos that they paid three hundred bucks after the <laughs> newspaper wrote for six weeks. You know, not right. that I'm bitter or anything. Thing broke after two days, but yep. got into real guns afterwards. It was a way better way. <laughs> um, but it's just, it's such a, like, when you put it into the realistic perspective, that's the, like, the comical part. Because when people read it as a legislation or as an order paper item or as a legislative summary, it has all the weight of the federal government behind it. And Justin Trudeau and all this pomp and circumstance. So then you go like, wait, so you're telling me a cop is going to go up to a 12-year-old and he's going to be like, that's a prohibited device. Get on the ground. Like, mm. Is that what we want? I thought we were aiming for less of that. <laughs> Are they, uh, they're banned for import now as well by that. Are they not? I think so, yeah. Yeah, I think I read it. CBSA does all the funky stuff because even before yeah, they just do whatever they legal, anyway. they ban it. So that's going to be an issue for the film industry uh, in a lot of ways because... Uh, uh, gas guns. airsoft guns, gas guns are a huge portion of what takes place and even more so now uh, with the way the film industry is with all the safety stuff that's going on, I know in Vancouver, uh, there's productions that I used to work on that uh, no longer allow any, uh, real guns on set and that's written into their contracts. Uh, so you know, when they're dealing with, uh, firearms and shooting and all that kind of stuff, uh, in their production, uh, it's basically CGI'd with, uh, airsoft guns. So as you well know, like you already mentioned, airsoft guns break and they fall apart and they don't last very long. Constantly. <laughs> Constantly. Uh, and so there is a, not an unlimited supply of airsoft guns uh, in Canada. So at some point those are going to run out. So I would ask what they're going to do at that point. Uh, they've already uh, made it so that uh, productions can't use real firearms written into their production contracts. Then now the airsoft guns are all basically gone. Um, and anything really that looks like a real gun is uh, going to be a prohibited as a replica. So where do they go from there? And the part that kind of kind of makes me interested is that a lot of the people uh, in film obviously voted for, uh, you know, it's for, film is fairly hardcore mm. left. They voted this stuff in. Uh, basically without really understanding the full impact, uh, of what kind of problems it's going to cause even possibly in their own job. And I think, I'm reminded uh, well, of I know for a fact, arguments there <laughs> I know for a fact <laughs> that some people are s- suddenly realizing what is going to happen, uh, possibly to their job or to the amount of jobs that they get, or even the TV shows and productions and movies that, arrive in Vancouver and, and undoubtedly the rest of Canada, uh, because we'll be all under the same, uh, rules. So, um, you know, action just, films were a huge thing. That's basically what I worked on back in the day, yeah, action films, TV shows, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and a lot of that, um, in my opinion, is probably going to have some issues with, you, uh, coming You know to what Canada. they do? They make an exception. They can make an exception. Yes. And, and then if they're going to make an exception on that, you have to turn around and say, well, what was the point of this to begin with? Yeah. Why in the beginning then? If this but that's is not where, a problem. So like when I was, when, for the, for the Senate testimony, when they email you for it, they basically give you some instructions, right? And 
they don't tell you what to say or anything like that. It's not, it's obviously like, it's very, very, very professional. So anyone listening, it's very cool. It's a really neat thing you do. But if you ever get the chance, highly recommend it. But they tell you like, you can't change big things. Like when the Senate gets it to start making amendments, and even when the parliamentary committees start getting it to make amendments, like the bill should be a little bit closer to, to, to ready. And actually, like what Ryan brings up with regards to the film industry, because I thought that right away as well. I mean, anyone that lives in Vancouver can't help but think of that, especially mm. if you're in the gun world, because film armors in Vancouver are like a big, big deal. Um, and with Netflix and, and with the with streaming services now buying so much more content, like the hours of content being produced now, uh, I mean, Ryan, you know better than I, but I'm pretty sure it's, it's, there's gotta be a lot more actual hours. Even when I got, than, when I was getting out of the industry, it was already uh, climbing. the Netflix shows and stuff were growing exponentially. They were building uh, studios in BC specifically to do Netflix uh, and Netflix, like those shows can't afford the real guns, right? Like I didn't know it was like, I, I knew that film was going more towards gas guns. Mm -hmm. I thought it was a cost thing, not so much a safety thing. I knew the safety was there, obviously. It's, yeah, it's more um, of a safety thing. It doesn't gotcha. really make any difference uh, to the production. They they end up renting um, either a gas gun or a real gun, and they can operate those on set uh, without one of us there, without one of the armors, generally, providing the, the uh, prop master has a, you know, a firearms license, and there's somebody there gotcha. that can deal with it. So I think it's just evidence it's though that like this thing. exception isn't already baked into the law is, is another case of, I just don't think they really intended this to go the distance. Like, I think they basically just drafted yeah. this thinking, yeah, it's about, it looks to me to be a law that is about 60% of the way to something that's yeah. actually capable of being It's taken. not thought through at all, really. No, no. They, so they didn't consult um, anybody on where it's going to And I mean, go. in some ways we can probably take a little bit of like, oh, that's good because... I'm glad to hear they didn't waste a bunch of time drafting a law they didn't intend to pass. I'm glad they just wasted minimal amounts of our time drafting a law they didn't intend to pass yeah. <laughs> at a time when there's some other stuff that they probably have on their priority table. But yeah, that, that film thing. How many, so percentage-wise, mm -hmm. when you were working, or if you have any idea now from like talking to people at mutual contacts and all, like what's the percentage yeah. between real guns and gas guns on film? Uh, in in your experience in Vancouver, just in your experience. <clears throat> when I was working and I think I left at the end of 2015, I would say it was probably, I bet you it was probably 60% airsoft uh, really? gas guns. And you think yep. it's gone up from there since uh, it's It's a hundred percent gone up because there were still all the WB shows like Supernatural and, uh, God, uh, Arrow and all those, uh, God, all the superhero, show. um, uh, stuff, the DC comic shows. I worked on yep. all of those and, uh, it was pretty regular. Like Arrow, we'd, you know, I'd have M60 machine guns out on it, handguns, all kinds of different things. Now, uh, none of those shows, uh, allow live fire, uh, like real blank fire gun on, on them. It's and is all that a, is it? Do you feel like that decision was made? Was that decision made entirely from a safety perspective or do you feel there was a degree of politics in that decision? Um, I think it, I think it was a cover your ass decision. Um, there's Lawyers, especially liability. Yeah. Liability for sure. I mean, we were always going through issues, uh, uh, with the production lawyers wanting to rewrite the contracts and all that kind of stuff. Uh, like our liability contracts that we had at the, at the time. And it was always a big, huge back and forth. And I think eventually it came to the point where they're like, well, you don't need a liability contract when, uh, you know, when you're running airsoft. So it's a, it's a safety issue. So let's just get rid of the real live fire guns. And that in turn got basically rid of the armors, unless there was something specific that there wasn't an airsoft gun for. There's no airsoft 50 cals. So if you had those out on set, you had to have the guys, but, mm -hmm. uh, now it's, it's well, different. I don't know how to be a film industry it. guy all of a sudden. Yeah. I mean, you know what? I got the, buddies with, that with are. With our dollar being at that money spot for film normally too, right? Yep. 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 I mean, it should be a very lively with the, with the dollar and everything right now and the tax credits and all that stuff. It should be pretty lively here, but, um, all the people I stay in contact with are like, yeah, there's, you know, it's, it's moderately busy at this point. You were talking about putting something on the back of the license and putting conditions on the back of the license earlier. And mm -hmm. it just brought to mind the back of my license. 
And by virtue of my age alone, I was not able to get a 25 or 32 caliber handgun or short barreled firearm, a section 12, six type firearm, but I was able to get a 12, seven inherited firearm. And you know what happened when my license renewed? I bet you do. You know what happened to my 12, seven? Okay. Well, this might be an interesting one that you can write about in caliber magazine. Uh, my 12, seven inherited, it turned into a 12, six. And guess what? I could purchase and buy and sell other 12, six firearms from other individuals out there. And I was concerned. I thought like, well, what's going on here? And I had actually, you know, in, in a CYA way contacted the firearms program and said, um, like what's going on here? And they said, we don't make mistakes. You're 12, six. We don't make mistakes. Okay. Fair enough. I got it in writing. Good to go. I can buy, sell all the rest. But the interesting thing was it didn't just happen to me. It happened to every other 12, seven inherited really? firearms owner in Canada. I've got pictures of the license and I've talked to other 12, seven owners who became 12, six. And now they've got a situation where they got a, some people, myself, by virtue of age, I was never able to, to even take advantage of the 12, six who were able to purchase other firearms and sell the firearms. And they had to turn around and try and quietly clean up this little mess. So when we look at these laws, when we look at C21 and even if we're to say this was the most well thought out in their intention, in the way they're going, we can't discount human error in these things and what those implications will have to the individual and to the businesses. Yep. Like for example, in the film industry, mm-hmm. um, just, just enough interesting aside on all of that. And if you wanted to write on that in caliber mag. <laughs> I'm interested. I'm kind of curious. I'm, I'm, I'm interested into why, cause I thought that was, I actually looked into that a few years ago and I, I got the impression that it was pretty expressly included from most of the assets I looked at that like that was not supposed to be the case. Like like twelve seven was supposed to be twelve seven. You get inherited only. They made a mistake. Never supposed to be expanded. But if it's happening to everyone, um, every single twelve seven became twelve six. And that it was sounds exp- more like an internal policy change. Cause legitimately once that stuff's like, I could see if yours did once and I could see the CFO saying, we don't make mistakes to cover yours, but if it's everyone's that's, that's an internal, that's, like an, that's error. an A tip that I need to file to say like, why is this happening? Hmm. Cause there's something happened. There would have been an internal, like from my knowledge of how the firearms program works, there would have been something internal circulated to, to dictate that transition occurring. Cause it's a change, right? Like it's, they, they didn't renew your license. They changed your license. They had to do something to do so. Have you renewed since that uh, went down? I have. And it stayed? Uh, until the point where they had to correct it all. And they had to uh, course correct with all other 12 sevens who were, became 12 six. And they have changed them all back. Hmm. That's weird. So, so we that's just where I a, think. That, that could be human error, that could be computer glitch, that could be whatever yeah. it might be. But when we start going down this road of trying to make policy and trying to make laws and regulations, we have to look at it, like you're saying from Daniel, from the perspective of the victim, of the person and how, how they will be impacted on it. We have to look at it from the perspective of the, the film industry, from the individual owner and how, how they may be impacted, but what rights are we giving away when we bring these things in, should a mistake like this happen to happen? And they, they happen more often than you'd think. Well, that's what I would say. Like my big take home message for people when I've done radio interviews is always TV and stuff is just don't, you have an amnesty period, use it. Like the government has given you that amnesty period, just like they give you back some money at tax time, you know, use it. Like when the government gives you something, take it and use it. Hmm. Um, so don't do anything until then, because the more time elapses, the more this stuff will get fleshed out. And for all we know, I mean, the long gun registry amnesty continued until the long gun registry ended. So mm. in your it, opinion, it Dan, could, is this going to, is this going to stretch on and the amnesty will have to be extended at some point? I mean, to, that, that's kind of my ex- thought. I think the amnesty extension will be predicated by the compliance rate. Yeah. And the compliance rate is going to be dismal. So the amnesty will be extended yeah. indefinitely because at the end yeah, of the day, they sure. don't want to reach a point where, cause that's what the, that's what the liberals got into with the long run registry, right? Was, was people that may have supported it initially, um, 
even in a passing way. Like I know people, I was at the Vancouver Gun Club arguing why the long gun registry should die when it was first killed because people that shoot shotguns at clay pigeons sometimes think gun control is good. And in that discussion, like you just kind of go like, it's, I don't know, man. Like I don't, no one will comply and the government will be stuck with this. Like, do we put everyone in jail? How do we deal with it? Or, or is, or is leaving the threat of that over their head, ostracizing voters? Like, like, let's say you're the 150,000 AR-15s in the country, 130, whatever it is, right? There's a lot more Norinco M14s in the country. A lot more. SKSs. Um, mm. A lot of SKSs. But the big one is, the, the, I use the M14 specifically because I think it's the most, maybe the Mini-14 is maybe the most popular mm-hmm. newly prohibited firearm, right? Um, if I have an M14, but I don't own an AR-15... I feel a bit insulated from Justin Trudeau's gun ban. I probably feel somewhat slighted by it by going like, I can't use my M14. But you got to remember too, like we are all hardcore gun guys for whom guns are part of our daily lives. For a lot of people, their M14 might be something they haven't seen in two years, right? They they got it before they had kids. They were shooting with their buddies. Everyone had kids, shooting less and less. He keeps it for the eventual hunting trip he plans to go on at some point in the next 10 years, right? He probably doesn't like AR-15s because he probably looks at the headlines and he's never been in the gun world and he thinks it's a quote-unquote weapon of war. Like, these are the sorts of people that Justin Trudeau is worried about. He's not worried about us because he knows where we stand. But it's those sorts of people for whom the amnesty will be extended because he'll be looking at those guys going, if I keep looking like I'm going to throw this guy in jail, he might vote for someone else. If I keep looking like I... I don't really mean to hurt him. This is intended. Like, if the law says I'm going after legal gun owners, but the government does not go after legal gun owners, by default, a whole bunch of those legal gun owners will still vote for the party that is not going after them because they are not doing the thing they said they would do. And what the conservatives need to realize is talk is cheap. The liberals talk all the time, and then they don't do anything. Like, they won't take the guns even out of the houses like when you actually think about those arguments the anti-gun people said of like you've promised to take assault weapons off the street etc etc and now you're just going to let everyone keep them Mm -hmm. if you were an anti-gun person and you had spent years lobbying you would be super super angry right like Mm -hmm. i think there are a few you finally get pretty angry you get you listen to bill blair across the table tell you yeah we're making we have the single strongest anti-gun bill in canada's history and you go but everyone gets to keep their ar-15 like I'm sure they're just as pissed as we are because we're coming at it from the opposite sides. This yeah. is not going to do what either of us <laughs> we're want. We're allies. And that's the, that's the ironic part is we argue with the people that are on like, mm-hmm. and some of them aren't on the same team because I'll admit like some of the groups just want all guns gone. They don't want you to hunt. They don't want you to have any guns. Yeah. They just, no guns at all. They don't like guns. They're hoplophobic and they've managed to find a way to turn that into a hobby. <laughs> but for by and large a lot of these people and we've seen it because there have been some people that started out on a staunchly anti-gun argument that if you say look i'm on your side dude like i'm not i don't i like to keep my guns that's but that's besides the point what i want to do is save lives and stop these kids from shooting each other and stop the suicides and stop this and stop that then oh okay all right then this they start to nod their head and they go this makes sense you're on the same side okay yeah you know and it humanizes us a bit too, but it also gives us some credibility that we're we're kind of lacking these days. Empathy, mm-hmm. yeah, it's really empathy, a bit of yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. So it's hard though, because I mean, the other thing too is, I think for Canadians at large, it's really hard because the people that are victimized by these crimes are always, and I I'll say this: this is showing to sound super woke myself. This is showing my own privilege. So I'll freely admit that I am the people that are victimized by a lot of these crimes are people that are not that, that people like myself have trouble associating with. I am not a gang banger. I've never been involved in the drug trade. I'm not a violent person and in the freaking least. Um, so for me, it, it's, it's another world. It's like reading about, I mean, when I read about the stories that come out of Jane and Finch and some of those downtown areas of Toronto, I've been down there, I've driven down there. Um, it's pretty eye-opening, yeah, it's pretty but crazy. it doesn't feel like Canada. Like, it doesn't feel like the Canada I know, because I come from the mountains of BC. Like, I drove through downtown to Toronto, looking at the, the areas where these shootings happen, and I go, like, I don't even recognize this place. It's another world. And when I see the headlines coming out of those areas, it feels like something else. And I think that's what, especially because gun owners are, typically, we have higher than average household incomes. We have more stable lives. We have more complete family units amongst our population than the national averages. And that gives us a different perspective that is, it makes it hard for gun owners to, 
it makes it very hard, I think, for gun owners to have sympathy and empathy for the people on both ends of these violent crimes because, and, and you see it writ large amongst the population that more people have been killed by opioid overdoses than by COVID. Mm. But more yeah. people are willing to make massive concessions to their daily lives because of COVID. But no one would make a single concession about opioids because, quote unquote, the people that overdose are not like me. Mm. And that's, if, if you want to know where I think Canada is going wrong, that's where it is. And it's across the board. And it's, it's, we just don't read about the gangbangers and, and gun owners. It's almost like they're proud to say, that's not me. Instead of going, that could have been me. He's one of us. There by the grace mm-hmm. of God go I, right? Like yeah. your childhood unfolds a little bit differently, you know? Yeah, exactly. That could be you. Mm. Yeah. That's good. Well, Daniel, Ryan, thank you very much. This was an excellent podcast. Uh, listeners out there, if you have thoughts, please let us know. You can email them, leave them on YouTube, leave them in the, in the comments on the, uh, the podcast there. Make sure, check out Caliber Magazine. There's plenty of good content in the magazine, just like you've been hearing from Daniel here. And if you want to take your rifle to 11, check out IBI, (laughs) get yourself an IBI barrel. Thanks guys. Oh, thanks for having us. Yeah, likewise. And I'll continue to be the strongest reason why these podcasts need a mute button for the guests. No. (laughs) (laughs) Need to talk more, not less. Absolutely. (laughs) I'm trying. We're open. So, yeah.